Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about diagonalization. And so this is picking up where we've been talking about matrices lately. And so let's talk about this process. So to compute a to the k, so that means you have a matrix and you want to raise it to a power. We're going to find a useful factorization, which is going to be of this form, where our matrix equals p times d times p inverse, where d is a diagonal matrix. Okay. And so what this is saying is that we can rewrite our matrix A in terms of another matrix D. And then what we do is we left multiply by some matrix P and right multiply by its inverse P inverse. And so why we do this, it's because computing powers of a diagonal matrix is actually a lot easier than doing that for a non-diagonal matrix. So here's just a quick example. So here's a, a matrix A. This is a diagonal matrix already. And um, so diagonal matrix means it has entries in the diagonals and zeros elsewhere. And so notice a squared, if we wanted to just raise this to the second power, it's just the matrix times itself. And so when you work this out, doing row one times column one and putting it over here in the spot for spot, and you do that for all of the, the spots in your two by two, look what you end up getting. The matrix with zeros still in the other positions and then numbers in the diagonals. But really, this is just 1 squared in the top left corner and 4 squared in the bottom right corner, which correspond to the entries of the original matrix, A. So A squared ends up just being the entry squared. And so this works if the, diagonal, if the matrix is diagonal. So in this case, A is a diagonal matrix to start with. And so what we want to do is we want to go through this process of um, diagonalizing a matrix, if it's possible. So in general, for a diagonal matrix D, and by diagonal we have numbers in going down to the right, but then zeros elsewhere, we could just say that D to any power is the diagonals to that power. And this is true for any power uh, one or more. And so now let's try this. Given that A equals P times D times P inverse, find A squared. So notice we're given A. It's not a diagonal matrix this time but we know that it is equivalent to this inverse P, or sorry, this matrix P times this matrix D, which is a diagonal matrix, times the inverse of P. And so most of the time you're not going to be given the inverse of P, but you can find it using your techniques for finding inverse matrices. In this case it's just a 2 by 2, so I'll remind you how to find that inverse. Okay, so notice what we have. A squared just ends up equaling P times d squared times p inverse. And here's the reasoning for why that ends up being true. So a, we know what it equals in terms of p and d. And so this is just a times itself. And then using associativity, we can put our parentheses around our p and p inverse. And that's just going to be i, the identity matrix, anytime we have p times its inverse. And so what that ends up giving us is just d times d in the middle. And that's where this d squared comes from. And so this equals P times D squared, known as squaring the diagonals, times P inverse. And so for the 2 by 2, just recall that the inverse is 1 over the determinant, and then you swap A and D, and then put minus signs on B and C. And we can do this another way. Even though let's just ask for A squared, let's just keep going. Let's say we wanted A cubed. Notice what we're going to get. We're going to get P times D cubed times P inverse. And here's just the reasoning for it in the middle here. Notice that we have, this is equivalent to A. So this is A times A squared. And then associating the P and P inverse in the middle, that's just going to be I, giving us a total of D cubed in the center. So in general, if we want A to the K, it could be written as P times D to the K times P inverse, as long as we can find D and P. And then also, of course, it's inverse. Okay, so for this example, in general, this is what we would get. This was our matrix D, raising it to the K power. This was P over here, and this is P inverse. Okay, so a square matrix is said to be diagonalizable, so this is a definition, if it's similar to a diagonal matrix D. So previously, we talked about similar matrices, and so, in other words, that means that A equals P times D times P inverse. So some invertible matrix P, and then some diagonal matrix D. Okay, so 
a matrix is called diagonalizable, if this is true, if it's similar to a, a diagonal matrix D. And by definition of similar, which we talked about last time, that means this is true right here, this equation. Here's a theorem for us. An M by N matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if it has N linearly independent eigenvectors. So remember, if it, you have an if and only if statement, it goes both directions. So this means that if you have a matrix with n linearly independent eigenvectors, it's diagonalizable. And if you know it's diagonalizable, you know it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So we can expand this theorem just a little bit and mention a little more of what it's implying. So this means that the columns of P are n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. And then also, the diagonal entries of D are eigenvalues of A. So in other words, A is diagonalizable if and only if there's enough eigenvectors to form a basis of Rn. And so we call such a basis an eigenvector basis of Rn. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. We're actually going to diagonalize the following matrix if it's possible. So basically what that means is we need to find an invertible matrix P and also a diagonal matrix D such that A equals P times D times P inverse. So in the last example, we were given P and D. This time we're not given any of that, we're just given A. So we're gonna to try to diagonalize this. And so in order to do that, we're gonna break it into four steps. So step one is going to be to find the eigenvalues of A. So that's gonna be done by solving the characteristic equation, the determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero. So previously, we came up with this characteristic equation and talked about it, and so now we're just going to work on solving it. And so zero equals the determinant of a minus lambda i. And so notice what we have, some subtle things here to mention. Notice that these are vertical lines, no longer brackets. And so that's letting you know that's the determinant. And then a minus lambda i, when you do that subtraction, it just ends up being the diagonal entries minus lambda. So that's kind of the quick way to get to a minus lambda i. Just say the diagonals minus lambda. And so if we want the determinant, this is a three by three, you have some options. And for me, what I, I would do here is I would um, do my cofactor expansion. And we've done this in the past, so hopefully if, if you want to try that out, just pause it and try it. You can do cofactor expansion across any row or down any column. And then what you're going to get is the following. So after you do your cofactor expansion down any row or column, then we have negative lambda cubed minus 3 lambda squared plus 4. And even though this is a cubic equation, it factors really nicely, which is good for us because then we can find the eigenvalues very quickly. So we have that um, lambda is 1 and then lambda is negative 2. This one has multiplicity 2 because it's in a factor that appears twice. Okay, so... Real quick again, to do this determinant, just do it, um, either two things, cofactor expansion down a row or column, or you can row reduce this if you want, but then just remember what uh, row operations affect the determinant. So these are all things we've talked about previously, but either way, either row reduce this, keeping track of what changes you made and how they affect the determinant, or doing your cofactor expansion is how you get right here to this equation. And so we called this the characteristic uh, polynomial previously. So we got our eigenvalues. Now step two is to find n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. So that means that we're going to solve this equation. A minus lambda i times x equals zero. And the way we're going to solve this is we're going to go ahead and write it in an augmented matrix. And so um, this step is actually critical, so if you do this step and it fails, it, as in you try to get a solution to this augmented matrix and there's no solution, then you can actually stop because that means A is not diagonalizable. Alright, so for us, we actually need three vectors because N was a, uh, A was a 3 by 3. So depending on the size of your original matrix, that's how many corresponding vectors you're going to be looking for. All right, so for our eigenvalue 1, we have, notice, this is a minus lambda i in the augmented matrix. So our far right column is 0 from our equation here. 
And then lambda in our case is a one. So this is just our entry from A minus our lambda one. Our entry from A minus our lambda equals one and so on. So that's this augmented matrix. And then you can simplify and row reduce this. After a few steps, you would end up getting this equivalent matrix right here. And so from here, we can write out our general solution. We have that x1 plus x2 is 0 from row 1. x2 plus x3 is 0 from row 2. And then notice that x3 is free. There's no pivot in the third row. And so if remember, anytime you have a free variable, you want to rewrite your base, uh, basic variables in terms of those free variables. So we end up getting that x1 equals x3 and x2 equals negative x3 because x3 was free. And so our basis for lambda equals 1, we're going to call it v1, is just going to be 1, negative 1, and 1. And how I got numbers here is because everything was um, in terms of our free variable. So you just choose a value for your free variable. I chose 1. So I said, if I let x3 equal 1, then x3 is right here. It's 1. x2 is negative of x3, so it's negative 1. And then x1 equaled x3, so it's positive 1 as well. So that's how I got my first vector. Now for our second eigenvalue, it had multiplicity 2. And then remember, we needed a total of three vectors anyway. So we actually get two corresponding vectors for this eigenvalue. And now, um, I didn't work through the process here to show you, but it's exactly the same thing we did for the eigenvalue of 1. And then what you would do is just choose, I'll show you what I did here, two different values for your free variable, or free variables. In this case, both x2 and x3 were free. And so for my first vector, v2, I just said, okay, I'm going to let x2 be 1, x3 is 0, and then that's how I got v2. And then I chose different values. I said x2 is 0, x3 is 1, to get v3. Okay, so two vectors from the eigenvalue negative 2, one vector from the eigenvalue 1 for a total of three vectors, which we needed because a was a 3 by 3. And then if you want to, if you want to check your work before moving forward, you can verify that these three vectors are linearly independent. So our third step, remember we have four steps total for this, is to construct P from the vectors that you got in the previous step. And the order you choose doesn't matter at this step. So I'm just going to stick with the order we, we wrote them in, V1, V2, V3, but it doesn't matter which order you pick. So notice this is V1 in column 1, this is V2, and then v3 in column 3. And then our fourth and final step is to construct the diagonal matrix D from the corresponding eigenvalues. So we just found P, now we're finding D, and those are the things we needed. And so D is just going to have our eigenvalues in the diagonal. So D is really easy to find, but just be aware in this step, it's essential to keep the same order from your previous step. So in the last step, step 3, our eigenvalues um, corresponding to our eigenvectors. The first one, the first column corresponding to an eigenvalue of 1. So I'm, I'm making sure I put that in column 1. And then the next two vectors corresponding to the eigenvalues negative 2. So make sure those go in the second and third column. So order does matter on step 4. And so that we found what we were looking for. So we found P and we found D. And it's a good idea to check that this is actually true, that A in fact equals P times D times P inverse. And so you can work this all the way out, but there's actually a kind of a shortcut here. As long as P is invertible, and you can check the, with the P that you got that it's invertible, then you can actually avoid computing P inverse and just simply verify that AP equals PD. So if you wanted to know where this came from, it's just by timesing both sides of this equation by p. And so you'd have a p inverse times p, which is just i. So this is a little bit of a less computation than doing the whole thing over here, this equation. And so a times p, here's a, times p. And if you work out the multiplication, you would get this matrix here. And then here's p, 
times it by d, and you would get this result, and they're equal. So we know we, we did it right. We found both uh, the correct p and d, and therefore a was diagonalizable, and we just diagonalized it. All right, the last thing to mention to you is the theorem an n by n matrix with n distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable. So for example, here's this matrix. Notice it's in triangular form. So we can quickly tell that the eigenvalues are the main entries, 5, 0, and negative 2. And because this is a 3 by 3, and there's three distinct eigenvalues, this is a diagonal diagonalizable matrix. But a quick caution on this, the opposite is not necessarily true. So if you have a diagonalizable matrix, it doesn't mean necessarily that you have distinct eigenvalues. The other, it's only this direction. If you have n distinct eigenvalues, then we know it's diagonalizable for sure. Okay, so that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.